to the Overwatch What's New panel. <laughs> you guys gotten a chance to play yet? Yeah. yeah. All, right. All right, because uh, with me I have two very special guests. I have Arnold Sang, he's the assistant art director on Overwatch. This is the guy who drew every single one of those heroes you saw in that lineup. Arnold Sang. Hey everybody, how's it going? And we have Jeff Goodman here, who is the lead hero designer. He was also Little trivia for you. <laughs> Any, anybody here play World of Warcraft? This is the guy who made Onyxia, Cthun, Nefarian, the Lich King, every, every one of those Rafe. You gotta like one of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever wondered if Onyxia's deep breath had changed, ask yeah, Jeff. Right. He was the guy. Put a little random thing, I'd change it every time. <laughs> All right, so we have a lot of stuff to cover with you guys. We're going to give you a quick update on how the beta is going. We're going to talk about the big console announcement. We're going to run through the new map, Hollywood, that we talked about today. And probably what everybody's the most excited about is to hear about the new heroes. So the beta, let's talk about that. Um, so we pulled these stats uh, as of Tuesday, which was a week of the beta running. We started October 27th. Um, we didn't want to make the PowerPoint too close to the date of the, of the panel here. So as of Tuesday, we had had 82,000 matches played. So this was already, as of uh, yesterday, over 130,000 or something like that. So the people in the beta are playing a ton. We're learning a ton from it. We're looking at our matchmaker. We're gauging our servers. And we're also seeing a lot of uh, balance changes that we want to do in the future. And Jeff will talk a little bit about some of that stuff maybe during the Q&A. <laughs> so the average well, match length, <laughs> did I scare you with the balance changes? <laughs> it's Set perfectly it balanced. We have an announcement. <laughs> yeah. It didn't leak on Reddit. The game is perfectly balanced. <laughs> That's right. Every I can leave that. I can right. be done here. Everybody, please tweet that right now. <laughs> um, so, OK, average match length. Who has a guess? Close. Four minutes, 10 and a half. Average match length, seven minutes and 34 seconds. OK. <laughs> There's your important statistic of the day to remember. OK. Who do you think is the most played hero in Overwatch? Hey, Reaper, Tracer. Reaper. I'm hearing a lot of Reaper. Yeah, Reaper as well. You, unfortunately, are incorrect. <laughs> it is Farah. Yeah. So I, I think but there's again, a lot of... Perfectly balanced, so it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's all the, like, the old school tribes oh, and yeah, Quake yeah. 3 players out good there. Good level rocket launcher. That's yeah. my most played hero. He's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Farah's pretty good. Okay. Who do you think you should have on your team if you want your team to have the best chance of winning? Bastion. I'm hearing Mercy. Mercy, Mercy and Bastion is yeah, what I'm those hearing. The first, those are the two I hear. Okay, this one's a sleeper. Symmetra. Bam. Insanely powerful. And it's not because of the teleporter. It's those shields. Those shields are really, really good. She's very strong. Yeah, so we're learning a lot from the beta. We're gathering tons of data and statistics. We'll try to uh, share more of that stuff with you guys as it progresses. Um, but let's talk, about, let's talk about the console a little bit. Um, that was a huge announcement. Um, how many of you guys are Xbox One and Play PlayStation 4 players? All right. We're really excited to bring this, this game to consoles. We felt like with Reaper of Souls, we learned what enthusiasm there was behind playing Blizzard games on console. I mean, Blizzard games started on console, after all. Um, so it's going to be really great. We feel like we're going to speak to a large audience. I, I wanted to answer a few things about console for people. Um, one, when we started to make Overwatch, a lot of people ask, like, oh, you decided to port the game to console at some point. Uh, that was never the case. When we started to develop Overwatch, it was our goal from day one to have this game playable 
on console. It was a, kind of a dream of ours. And in a weird way, designing the game so it felt great on a console controller almost put like this enforced design elegance on us. Like you really thought about how many buttons are we going to add and how, what is the control scheme going to be for this sort of thing. So we had a, a little uh, funny snafu that happened in the beta. It was a little bit controversial where people were wondering, why is there aim assist on the <laughs> on the gamepad controller. And if you notice, we turned it off right away. We're like, oops, our bad. And it was really funny that nobody went, wait a second, this <laughs> thing's probably coming to console. That's, I'm sure that's why it was there. Um, the other thing about console that we think is going to be uh, really amazing is we're going to do full inter integration with Xbox Live and PlayStation Network. Um, you guys will be able to play this game in the comforts of your living room. And just to sort of preempt a question that I know is out there, Console players and PC players are not going to play against one another. They're their own separate ecosystems. So, you know, PC players will only play with PC players. Xbox One players will only play against Xbox One players. And PlayStation 4 players will only play against PlayStation 4 players. So um, that's the way console is going to work. Hollywood the new map that we introduced. So I think this one was a curveball for a lot of people. Um, we, we started sending that teaser out. We, we sent a teaser out of that space uh, movie right. poster. Um, and a lot of people wonder, well, why, why Hollywood? Um, the truth is, we feel like there's a fantasy behind locations, um, whether you've been there or not, that really defines Overwatch. We want the real world to be the setting for our game, but we want it to be the blizzardized version of the real world. So what that pretty much means is our version of Hollywood is one in which you won't get shanked. No, I'm just and, <laughs> <laughs> so, That's only funny for people from California. Right. <laughs> from everybody else in the world, they're like, yeah, Hollywood looks beautiful, it's gorgeous. But um, there's a real fantasy behind sort of going through Hollywood. And um, I think a lot of us uh, harken back to Hollywood of yesteryear and, and how cool it was. So the map starts off, you're on the streets um, of Hollywood, Hollywood Boulevard. There's a lot of fun stars to look at on the ground. Um, then you make your way to Goldshire Studios. It, it was the one studio name that we were able to find where we weren't going to get sued for, for using it. So, for argue about or at least it maybe, yeah, maybe the WoW team is going <laughs> to sue us for it. But um, so you go to Goldshire Studios. Um, obviously, you've got somewhat of a choke point here. We've, we've, we've found players in the beta evolving. Like early on, there's a lot of feedback. Like chokes are impossible. I don't know why you have them. Um, well, guess what? Farah can just fly over it, and Tracer can blink 30 meters through it. So um, trying to play the map like it's DE dust is probably not the best <laughs> idea. Um, just pro tip. I'm no pro gamer. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, so you, after you get through the studio, you go to the, the Hollywood backlot par portion of it. And this is really fun if you've ever been on a, a Hollywood studio backlot. Um, you know, they're all facaded. From a gameplay standpoint, there's a lot of cool overhangs and balconies. So when you play Reaper on this map, you take totally different routes through the map. You, you, you kind of stick to the interiors under the, under the overhangs, but someone like Farah or Widowmaker is spending most of their time on the rooftop. So it's a really fun gameplay style. Personally, I only play McCree when my team is in the <laughs> backlot area. Um, and I, I pretty much role play it the whole time. But um, it is rad. That is, falls over the railing. It's like too yeah. Totally. That's like the opposite of the pro tip. Like <laughs> the best way to play Overwatch is just role play the whole time. <laughs> um, I do that with Hanzo a lot. So then, then <laughs> afterwards, you make your way into the sound stage where they happen happen to be fil filming um, almost this retro space movie that we think is really cool. There's somewhat of an Easter egg in, um, in this screenshot. Um, our favorite uh, film director of all time is, we, we've called out a little call out to him. So on the back of that director's chair is Jeff Chamberlain, the guy who directed the announcement cinematic that we showed last year at BlizzCon, um, in case you were wondering. And then finally, you make your way, the, the final point, what you're doing in this map is you're escorting a payload, and that payload is a famous Omnic director who has a, a heavy price on his head because Omnic human relations are very strained in the world of Overwatch. 
And uh, this, this director's name is Halfred Glitchbot. Um, for, for a while, we explored using names like Robot Downey Jr. Right. And, and then there was Robot De Niro. We really weren't so creative. And, and, yeah, <laughs> Robot Redford and all of that. So in, in, our, uh, in our efforts to uh, stay legally cool with everybody, right? Um, we have Halford Glitchbot, and you get him to the end here, um, and it's a lot of fun. The, the trailer's got another Easter egg on it. It's, uh, it's uh, Tyrael is the brand there. Um, you also see cameras in the map that are Kilrog brand. So we thought Hollywood <laughs> was a really fun map. We hope you guys have as much fun with it as we do. We want there to be a big variance in Overwatch locations. So you have very serious locations like Watchpoint Gibraltar, but then some fun locations, lighthearted, like the arcade in Hanamura where you can smash arcade machines while you wait for the match to start, um, or Hollywood itself. But what you're probably the most excited to hear about is the three new heroes. So there's nobody better to talk about these than the two gentlemen on my left. Arnold, Jeff, why don't you walk us through them? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so the first hero we want to talk about is May. Now, if you guys remember from the, the opening, the, the cinematic of Overwatch last year, Overwatch is about soldiers, scientists, adventurers, oddities. Now, we have a lot of soldiers in Overwatch. We even have a guy called Soldier 76. We got, you know, uh, Cowboy McCree. We got all these badass heroes. We needed more scientists and adventurers. Um, that's where May comes in. She'd probably fit right in with the League of Explorers. Um, so May is a peerless climatologist. She works as a scientist for Overwatch. And in addition to, you know, saving the world from the Omnic crisis and all these other military threats, Overwatch is also looking at other threats that might threaten humanity, such as environmental threats. So to do that, they've set up all these eco-watch points throughout the globe. So May was stationed with a, with a team at eco-watch point Antarctica, and they were doing research there on, you know, the South Pole, all that stuff, and when there was a polar ice storm that cut them off from the rest of humanity, they lost communication with Overwatch, they were stranded, running out of supplies. So what May did, being the brilliant scientist that she is, she took all their equipment and rigged up this cryostasis chamber and put everybody in cryostasis to wait for rescue. And the thing is, nobody came to rescue them. Years passed. Overwatch was disbanded. Uh, the Omnic crisis was over, and the world changed around her. And one day, May was eventually discovered, but she realized that you know, her, her crew, um, she was the only survivor and the world had changed around her. All the eco watch points had been shut down. And now she basically travels the world, going to the, all of these eco watch points, trying to turn them back on, trying to collect the data, and try to fight all the different threats that might you know, threaten our, our planet. So a little bit about how we came to this design. Um, one of the things we always wanted to do with Overwatch was introduce you know, the mechanic of ice and freezing people. We thought that was so cool. Just freezing people, making them slow down, um, making ice walls, and she does all of that stuff. Shoots icicles at you. I mean, Jeff will talk more about that later. Um, so to do that, we really wanted to, the, a silhouette that captured somebody that, you know, plays with ice and is from, from somewhere really cold. So, you know, you, you see a lot of cool, badass poses in the Overwatch lineup, so we really wanted something that stood out. We gave her a big poofy jacket with a big parka hood. And then we gave her this big ice cannon. But then we realized, you know, looking, at, looking back, she looked a lot like um, another hero in the, li in the lineup, Zarya. She also had a, a big two-handed white colored cannon, big poofy pants and boots. So we went back to the drawing board, we explored a little bit, and did a couple sketches. And we did a, a sketch where she was just kind of casually hanging out. And we gave her glasses just for fun. And the team really loved it. We really resonated with the team. And she, we really felt it was a really adorable way to portray this brilliant scientist out to save the world. So we rolled with that. And that evolved our, our design to what you see in the final concept here. Um, so, and she also has a, you can kind of see it on, over her shoulder there. She's got a little drone called Snowball, which follows her around in her adventures. I mean, she basically travels alone to all these eco-watch points. Gets pretty lonely. So her little buddy kind of just, um, travels with her, and he's also like this weather manipulation bot. Um, but uh, all that gameplay stuff, Jeff's going to get into it. He's way more uh, suitable to talk, to talk about that stuff, so I'll let Jeff take it from here. Sure. 
Yeah, so let's talk about May's gameplay. Uh, she was super interesting to make. Uh, as Arden said, we, we kind of came at her from this perspective of we're looking at our whole roster and we have, we have characters like Widowmaker, she's like this ruthless assassin, and then we have Soldier 76, a hardened soldier, and like we don't really have anybody who's sort of like almost in a way doesn't belong, but she's there and she's like, I'm here. It was just, it was an interesting challenge um, to incorporate that into the gameplay as well. And uh, it actually opened up a lot of opportunities for us because she's she plays very different than a lot of pretty much every other hero we have so far, um, and that she's she's actually really hard to kill. She doesn't dish out a ton of damage, but she really assists and sets up her team for like these amazing team moves. And um, so so getting right into it right here, her gun is called the Endothermic Blaster. It's it's like a, that one-handed gun she has right there. It sprays this sort of freezing liquid. It's kind of on the canister on her back. It comes from there. Um, it doesn't do a lot of damage, but if you can hold it on people for long enough, they get like progressively slower and slower, and then they eventually just freeze, and then they're stunned for a little while. And you're, again, she doesn't do that much damage, but she, that freeze effect is amazing to set up your team, or if they're low or something, you can finish them pretty easily. Uh, it also has an alternate fire. If you press the alternate fire, uh, it, she like freezes a little icicle inside the gun and shoots that off like a shard of ice. It's really accurate. Uh, it's a little hard to aim because you have to like set it up. You, sh you click it, and it does a little bit of delay before it fires, but people are getting really good at it already, <laughs> I can tell. Um, her first ability is Ice Wall, which you guys hopefully saw on the opening ceremony trailer. Uh, it's amazing. It's super fun to play with. It, it literally creates a wall. It's like a, a, like part of the level almost. I mean, it blocks uh, line of sight and projectiles and movement collision. It's everything. It's just, people can climb on it. Hanzo and Lucio can like skate along it. It's, it's just really fun. Um, it, it's it also as kind of flat on the top, so you can build it under yourself or under teammates and lift them up. Which is like sounds like kind of a neat trick, maybe not useful, but we found like just getting a bash into a spot where he can't normally get to is like super surprises the enemy team. Like, how did he get up there? What is that? So it this opens up a whole lot of opportunities for a team. It's really fun. Uh, second ability is called Cryo Freeze. For those of you guys, sounds like a lot of you played WoW. Uh, if you know about a Frost Mage, but a little spell called Ice Block. It's very similar to that. It's basically Ice Block. She can save herself instantly from danger, and she creates this sort of solid block around her, and that block will block projectiles, and the same thing as her wall. You know, Reinhardt charges you, and you hit it. It'll actually impact you and stop, so she, he won't like go through you and hit your team or whatever, so it's actually a good way to jump in front of him and stop him for your team. Um, her ultimate is called Blizzard, because it wouldn't be a Blizzard game if we don't have a ability called Blizzard in it, apparently. <laughs> um, she throws her robot Snowball off, and he, the cute little robot makes so much noise, goes up in the air and starts spraying, very similar sort of uh, attack that her primary fire does, but it sprays in a large area and starts freezing everybody, and it, it's kind of the same uh, effect as her primary fire. They get progressively slower, and it also stacks with her primary fire, so if you get in there um, while it's your ult's going off, you can kind of freeze them extra fast with your gun and set everybody up. Uh, it's an amazing team, team play move. It, the stun lasts quite a while if you can get everyone in there, and then you can have any of your team go in there and clean up. Um, we have a bunch of videos that we've made to show off a lot of the gameplay for all of our heroes. Uh, so no better time, way to show it than show these videos. I'll show it here. Was 
She's sorry. <laughs> I know. She apologized. <laughs> so that was May. And, and again, you can see these videos on YouTube and they're running on, at the Overwatch booth as well. So the second hero we, we like to talk about is D.Va. So D.Va is an ex-pro gamer who now pilots this awesome mech in, defen in defense of her homeland. Um, so with the Omnic Crisis, there was a lot of different manifestations around the world. You know, in Russia, they got attacked by all these bastion units and spider tanks. Um, but over on the Pacific side of things, uh, it manifested in a different way. There was, um, out in the South China Sea, under the, under the water, there was this Omnium, this factory where they create Omnics. But instead of creating a horde of Omnics, there was a giant Omnic that came out and attacked the Korean Peninsula. So what the Korean army did was they got, they, they formed a group called MECA, which stands for Mo Mobile um, mobile exo squad of the Korean army. And what they did was they had the, all these drones that defended the city against this giant Omnic. But this Omnic would go back into the ocean and come back every now and then, evolved and learning uh, from what he encountered last time. So he would upgrade himself and eventually disrupted the transmission of the drones and turned them against the Korean army. So what they did was they developed these piloted mechs. And these things they're like lightweight and they're really agile so they can maneuver around you know, the skyscrapers of the, 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 the cities while defending against this giant Omnic. And because they have pilots, they're able to withstand any jamming from the, from the Omnic technology. And who better for the pilots than to go to the country's most top elite gamers like D.Va herself. So D.Va is a, is a pro gamer. She's, you know, multiple-time world champion at StarCraft, all different kind of games. Everything that she plays, she's basically a StarCraft player. 6. StarCraft That's 6. That's right. <laughs> um, so she, she plays to win, she gets in the mech, and it's, it's basically like a game to her. She's just, you know, really competitive, and she's out there to take out all the Omnics. Um, so one of the things when we first started developing Overwatch, and we had, like, we have hero ideation meetings, and one of the types of heroes we always talked about was, oh, it'd be cool to have a hero that jumps in a mech and comes back out. And, you know, just having a mech hero in the game is something that everybody really wanted to do. So we, had, we did a lot of sketches. And the first one that really spoke to, spoke to the team was this little girl in a little pink mech. We thought it was really cute. And, but then once we started visualizing her in the game, it felt a little weird for the little girl to be running around the battlefield. So, we evolved a little bit. We went back, we iterated, and as you can see in, in number two, somebody had hooked this awesome idea of what if she's a pro gamer, and what if she like, kind of streams while she's in the battlefield taking down Omnix. And that was such an awesome idea. So we, we, we iterated the design, made it a little bit chunkier, put all these sponsor logos on it, and we thought we really had something cool. So we kind of distilled it. We made the mech even more big and chunky, as you can see in number three. We really wanted you to have that feeling of piloting this super heavy mech, these big cannons. And then one day, after this design, where everybody was super happy with it, <laughs> like the feeling of it, Jeff comes to my desk and he's like, you know that super huge heavy mech that we designed? That everyone's happy with? That everybody's happy with. <laughs> We want to make her fly. <laughs> right. So I was like, um, okay, this isn't really... Like, it, she looks so heavy and so grounded that it felt kind of weird just putting rocket boosters on her. So we went back to the drawing board. Um, as you can see, number four, there's another iteration. She get, started getting really, really big. And one of the interesting challenges of designing her was, like, it's almost like you take one of the biggest heroes in our game, like Reinhardt or Roadhog, and you put, like, Tracer inside them. And how can we have that fit and still work within the scale of the game. So that was a really interesting challenge, but we ended up with uh, number five, you can see on the right there, the final design, which I think is really cool. We added this little, the, her little cockpit bubble, which is actually has, has gameplay implications, like it's, it's her crit spot, it's like getting a headshot. Um, but anyway, I think Jeff's gonna go over some more of her sure. abilities. Absolutely. So as Arn said, this is a character we've been wanting to make for a long time, and we iterated on it for a while. 
Um, the, the big thing was we wanted a character who isn't just like a big mech and she's in it and then you know that's it, she dies and she just flies away or something or maybe she dies. We, we really wanted to create this character that can exist both in the mech and out of the mech, which was a pretty tricky design but it was pretty fun to work on. Um, so that is actually her, her passive, it's not technically listed here, but she kind of has a passive ability when she's inside the mech. If the mech ever takes critical damage, essentially if it dies, instead of you dying, you actually jacked out the back and you're like a different hero essentially, you get to play as the pilot. Uh, the pilot it doesn't have any abilities, it just it has for her uh, a, a light gun that she can shoot and, and try to build up a, her mech back again. But um, the, the majority of her timing is spending in the mech itself, and the mech's weapon is ca are called fusion cannons. It's kind of the guns you can see under, right under cockpit there. They're super rapid fire, essentially kind of shotgun. They fire like a, a blast, uh, a cone attack. Uh, they fire really fast and they do a ton of damage. The big downside to them is they slow you significantly while you're firing them. So if you, you, you sort of jump in there and you, you start shooting people and everyone sort of scatters and it's kind of hard to chase them down, but you're, as a tank, if she's a tank role, you're, it's sort of your job to create that space. You, you, know, you get in there and you carve out a space for your team or you push people back so your team can get in. Um, her first ability is called Boosters, as Arn mentioned, that was the ability we came up with to, to uh, work well with her cannons. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so the Boosters on a very low cooldown, they allow her to fly uh, in, in a similar way almost like Reinhardt can charge. It's like she charges, but you can actually aim quite a bit, you can turn you, uh, freely, and also you can just fly up in the air. So you can fly completely freely, but you are forced forward, um, but allows you to like get in close and start un unloading your guns and kind of making everyone run, run away from you, and the cooldown's short enough where you, then you can just chase after them and then like you just keep pushing people away. Um, she's great at creating that space. She also has an ability called Defense Matrix, which is super great team play move. Uh, it also protects her significantly. She basically projects this sort of area, really large area in front of her. Um, you can kind of see it in the picture there. And any projectiles, enemy projectiles that enter that area, she immediately shoots out of the sky. And it, there's no like limit on it or whatever. It's really amazing when you see like a Farrah jump up there and ult and she's shooting all her tiny little rockets down. And you're just like, nope. And it's just like, do 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 shoot them out of the, uh, the sky. It's amazing. Um, it works, so yeah, it works on the ultimates and everything. It's, it's, it's really insane. Uh, you can also use it to like cover allies, which is super fun. Like if you have, uh, you know, a, a Reaper who's running there and Death Blossom, you can just put it right on him, and you know that you're going to shoot everything down. That's trying to shoot, that's trying to take care of him. So it's really amazing for that. Uh, her ultimate's called Self Destruct. Uh, it's sort of another way she can exit the mech. You hit the button and you immediately eject out of the mech and it starts a timer and there's a five second countdown on it and it's a really loud effect and you hear a sound and a warning and, and everyone has to scatter because after five seconds it explodes and the biggest explosion our game has right now basically. Huge area. Um, don't try to run out of the range of this thing, let me tell you. <laughs> if you fight it, just kind of line of sight if you can or, or try to use a May wall or something like that to block it. Um, and on. So this is D.Va herself. Like I mentioned, she only has the light gun. She doesn't have any abilities, but she does have the ability as an ultimate to call the mech back if she can live long enough and do some damage. It's, it's very cheap cost ult, so you can get it pretty easily. Um, so it, it's, if the opponent kills you and you can get back and hide, it's kind of their job to try to hunt you down so you can't get back in and come right back at them. So we'll show you guys what this looks like. I play to win.
you did say nerf this. You heard that yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Raising our APM, right? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to regret that one. <laughs> that's true. I'm going to regret that one. Um, so that's it, right? That's all the heroes? Right. Oh, yeah. I think, was there, was there one more? I don't remember. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. All right. So everybody's favorite robot ninja, Genji. Um, we we're super excited, and, and it, was, it was really interesting to see everybody's kind of speculation after we kind of showed Genji on the poster last year about all his abilities and stuff like that. So we're going to shed some light on that today. So Genji, as you guys saw in the, uh, the gameplay trailer from the open, opening ceremony, is Hanzo's brother. So Hanzo and Genji are both from the Shimada clan, which is basically this, this ancient ninja clan who is now in the modern day more, more like a Yakuza gang. They run guns and drugs and all that stuff. And Hanzo was in, uh, in, in line to become the successor to, to, to leader. Their father is a leader of the, uh, the Shimada clan, and Genji was a younger brother. Um, but instead, Genji was more like just this playboy. He didn't really care about the family business. He would just go out and squander the family fortune and go party and have fun. And he didn't really care about the... Uh, about everything that you know, Hanzo had to endure, which was, you know, take on the family business. So when their father died, the elders of the Shimada clan went to Hanzo and said, "Hey, hey, Hanzo, you, you got to get your brother in line. He's he's a huge liability to the family. He's you know out there, causing all kinds of trouble." So basically, Hanzo and Hanzo confronts Genji, and they have this epic battle, and Hanzo basically. D delivers a fatal blow to Genji and leaves him for dead. Hanzo leaves the Shimada clan. At that point, Genji's just there at the brink of death when Overwatch finds him. Um, Dr. Angela Ziegler, also known as Mercy, resuscitates him and they give him a cybernetic body. So Overwatch has been keeping tabs on the Shimada clan for a long time and they needed that one key thing to take down the clan and that's where Genji comes in. They wanted Genji in, in exchange for giving him his new body to help them dismantle the Shimada clan, take him out for good. So at, at this time, Genji's, you know, he just got a new body. He just had this epic battle with his brother. He's a pretty torn dude. So he's basically this, this crazy secret weapon that Overwatch just sends in. They take out the Shimada clan. And, you know, Genji's mission is over. He basically leaves Overwatch in search, you know, in search, trying to search for, you know, this, his meaning to his, his new existence. And his journey leads him to Zenyatta. Under Zenyatta's tutelage, he finally becomes one with his dual existence, you know, his, his cybernetic side and his ninja human side. And now he's basically an adventurer. He roams the earth, you know, uh, do, having, having different adventures with, with members of Overwatch. So a little bit about how we got to Genji. I'm personally like ninjas and samurais and cyber ninjas, they're like my favorite thing to draw. So for Overwatch, the very beginning, we did so many different sketches of, oh, we gotta get the cyber ninja in the game, right? So the one that we ended up with that everybody liked was the one on the left you see there was the original Hanzo concept. We called him Hanzo at the time. And we did all these different sketches of different ninja abilities and weapons like the bow, the katana, shuriken, and like different hooks and chains and all, all kinds of stuff. And we wanted to cram it all into this one ninja. But one of our design philosophies was we wanted to keep you know, the design focused and have all the essential elements boiled down for that one character. So having all these different weapons didn't really kind of gel together into one hero. So one day, someone was like, why don't we make two ninjas? I'm like, yes, more ninjas, the more ninjas, the better. You can't have, can't have too many ninjas. Can't have too many ninjas. That's the rule. So I, I still remember. Um, in the room with you know, you know Chris Metzen and the guys, and we're like, oh, we came up with this awesome story about these two brothers. You know, their faiths intertwined. One with a sword, one with a bow. You know, Hanzo, he's actually a master swordsman, probably even better than Genji. But after delivering that final blow to his brother, he puts down the sword for good. And he picks up the bow, and then you know, Jeff came with awesome. The, the design team came with these awesome bow ideas for the, for, for Hanzo's storm bow. Whereas Genji, we gave him the sword. But that, that proved to have you know, some different challenges that, that Jeff will get into. Um, so without further ado, Jeff will talk a bit about Genji's abilities. Yeah. So as Arn said, 
Uh, and as you, kind of he was originally drawn, you guys saw him in the lineup, you didn't see shurikens, even his weapon is shurikens, but you didn't see them in his hand. Because the original concept was very simple. It was this guy with a sword, and it's just really scary. He gets up on you and cuts you up. Uh, it turns out that's not very easy to design. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, it, it, it's hard to make a character like that, that can have a sword like that as a primary weapon, but is also fun for both sides and feels fair to both sides. Um, so then we sort of had this realization like, well, what if we just made it as ultimate and then we can really make it the amazing thing we want it to make? And it's allowed to be frustrating because it's ultimate, right? <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so we really got to put all the power into it there. Um, so it's ultimate, as you see at the bottom, I guess starting from the bottom, is he pulls out the sword and it, it just does a ton of damage. He doesn't get it for, I think he has like 10 seconds over now. So you, you get it for a decent amount of time, but he can't have it forever. But he just carves everybody up. It's really scary. When you hear him pull that out, everyone's just like, oh my god, panic mode. Um, he normally runs around with a, a kind of a shuriken uh, he, a setup. He, he uh, has a shuriken um, sort of dispenser in his arm because his arms are actually all, you know, he's full cybernetic body and everything. So they're actually like inside of his arm. So he's a really cool animation where he like she pulls him out and he's holding three. Um, and he th normally throws him with a left click as a primary fire. He throws him kind of a burst fire one after another really fast. Uh, they're perfectly accurate, so if you're really good at sniping with these things and are good at leading people, they're really, really deadly. Um, he's an alternate fire where you can instead just throw them all at once, kind of in a fan pattern. It's good for if somebody's really low health, you just want to take them out, or there's a couple targets you want to hit, or big targets in front of you, you, you can hit them with all three, it's really strong. Uh, his first ability is called Swift Strike. Uh, he dashes forward. He has a, a small blade on his lower back, you can see there. He pulls that out and slashes with it. Uh, everybody he goes through as, takes damage over time continuously. And um, it also hit, uh, allows you to go any direction you're looking, including up. So unlike Tracer, he can go out, jump up off top of buildings or, or anywhere. You, you, know, you can jump up and slash a fair out of the sky or something. Um, that's really amazing for that. It also has a very interesting property where if you ever get an elimination of any kind, it resets the cooldown on it. So you can go on these tears where you just get on a roll and it's like, ah, I'm unstoppable, especially when you have the sword. It's amazing. Um, he has a second ability called Deflect. Hopefully you guys saw from the opening uh, ceremonies in, the, in that trailer, it was amazing. That ability he, he has, it, it for a couple seconds, he pulls up his blade, and any enemy projectiles that hit you are instead redirected as your projectiles to your cursor where you're looking. So it's amazing that you get a bunch of people shoot at you, and you just kind of focus on one person and deflect everything to that one person. Uh, super fun. It works on ultimates. We've had times where Azaria comes up with ults, and they got swift strikes and deflects it back at her team. It's just the, the, the possibilities are so fun with this thing. Um, he also has a couple passives. He can wall climb, much like his brother Hanzo. He also has a double jump. He does like an extra flip out of the air. So he's really mobile in that way, especially if he can get on those kill streaks like I mentioned with Swift Strike. So without further ado, let's see what it looks like in game.
If you guys get a chance to play, let me tell you, if you have a Widowmaker sniping on the enemy team, you can get the flex snipe shot right back to your head. It's the most satisfying thing yeah. you can do in the game. Yeah, it feels so good. So good. Farrah, Farrah Rocket Barrage yeah. is up there. Poor Farrah, she always gets picked on with a Rocket Barrage. I also like uh, when the, the enemy team has a Bastion. Oh, and yeah. You got somebody just going nuts. And I don't like to aim back at the Bastion. I like to aim at one of his teammates. <laughs> yeah, totally. And Bastion will just feed into the Genji and just kill <laughs> some poor teammate. <laughs> Stop shooting. That's all you have to do. Um, you guys like the new heroes? Awesome. Um, we had a ton of fun making them. I really hope that everybody here gets a chance to play them. Um, we love feedback on them as well. So anytime you see everybody wor working the Overwatch booth is a Blizzard employee, give them your thoughts. Um, you know, these are brand new heroes. We need feedback on them. They really change the way the game is played. We're excited to see the game evolve a little bit. Like D.Va, for example, and Genji are both tremendous um, counters to Widowmaker. So if you're concerned, like, oh, sniping is really strong in the game right now, you know, D.Va with, with her uh, defense barrier ability and her ability to just boost fly. up, yeah. You can use both at the same time. So you just fly right at her with that up, and she's like, okay, I don't know. Don't you like, push yeah. people too? <laughs> Worst case, just send up the thing and blow it up with the ult, you know. Right. <laughs> Take that Widowmaker out. Um, but we'd love to hear what you guys have to say about these. Um, before we get into Q&A, and we want to we leave as much time as possible for Q&A, there is a panel tomorrow called The World of Overwatch. No, we're not announcing an MMO. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have named that something else. No, that's, that's what, I, we didn't name the panel. <laughs> right. um, it's called The World of Overwatch. It's going to feature Chris Metzen, Michael Chu, and Bill Petras. And there's a lot of awesome stuff. So if you guys care about story and lore, Tomorrow morning, I think it's at 11.30 a.m. right here on this stage. That is the panel for you. Um, there's also going to be some really cool announcements and never before seen stuff. So I highly recommend, if you're a story person, coming to that panel tomorrow. Now, we're happy to take questions. We'll answer yeah. as, as many as we can in the time we have remaining. We'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. You're all supposed to just shout them out at the same time. No, I think there's a microphone over there. More Genji. Be beta keys. Oh. I thought you said manatees. I'm like, and then instantly my mind is racing. Like, I think Arn could come up with a manatee character. Right. Oddities. 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 We have a Winston. He's from That's the moon. Right. Manator, his friend. All right, are we ready with questions? Hi, uh, I am happy you guys announced the console versions of the game, but there's no Mac version announced right now. I wanted to know if you were going to make one. Uh, and if you're not, uh, why not? It's, it's a great question. As, as you know, Blizzard has uh, supported Macs um, in the past, and we've, we've always had a, a rich history of that. Um, currently, with the technology behind Max and the way Overwatch runs, it's, it's just too challenging for us at this point to support it. And our focus right now is entirely on PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. Hey guys, uh, thanks for making the game, first of all. Uh, quick question, have you thought about adding different modes into the game where you could lock it down so you couldn't switch a character? or maybe three or four times, or not at all, different modes? I mean, we're experimenting, uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> we're experimenting with new modes all the time. I mean, we have a bunch of internal stuff um, we play with. It's some is very hit or miss. You know, we, with our hero lineup, it can be pretty tricky to do uh, new modes. I mean, you, we've tried a lot of classic modes. That you guys have probably seen a lot of other games, like Capture the Flag, but it, it's been, that one in particular, for, and as an example, has been really tricky, because, like, is, was Tracer allowed to carry the flag? That seems kind of insane. Like, can she blink? Maybe she can't blink, but then that seems weird. Like, so the, it's stuff like that. I mean, so we're tr looking at other modes, possibly, in the future. I mean, we, we plan on supporting the game as long as people are playing it, so um, we'll definitely have more surprises down the line. Hello. 
Um, my question is because the game is made for consoles and controllers, are you going to have a company make a controller that works for PC? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can use your you can use a controller a gamepad right now on PC. Uh, actually, right now in the beta, it's supported, fully supported, uh, and it's, there's full Rumble support and everything in there. So it's. I was kind of hoping for maybe a specific one for just the game. Oh, I don't know. It's a cool idea. Yeah, it's, it's a cool idea. Great idea. We we would love. I like it. it. Yeah. I'd buy one. Uh, hello. Uh, most characters have like their utility ability on E and their movement ability on shift. Like Junkrat, he puts down his mind and moves. Uh, Reinhardt, he charges on shift. But you guys flip that for May, where like the wall that actually moves people is on E, but her invincibility, her ice block is on shift. <laughs> are you guys planning on maybe keeping the the status quo, or are you guys flipping it up a bit? Um, I, I think yeah. I mean, she doesn't have a movement ability per se. I mean, I guess. Uh, her shift makes her not able to move. <laughs> That's a movement ability. I guess in the same way that Bastion's shift is, is his movement ability and that he kind of locks himself down. So that's kind of where the parallel was drawn, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we, that, that's great feedback. And if we get that kind of stuff often, we've, in the past, we've actually swipped, swapped a few buttons around. I don't remember which ones. Jeff has actually I, yeah, pushed I, me. I, <laughs> was it, it was Ro uh, Roadhog, right? Yep. Yeah, Roadhog it used to be the other way around, and Jeff was just like, you must do it every day. You got to change this. You got to change this. All right, all right. Well, I kept trying to hook people, and then he'd just start huffing the thing. <laughs> right. Not good. So there's still, there's still possibility, but that's great feedback. One other thing, that a question that comes up a lot about the way that the keys are bound, um, you can totally oh, yeah. rebind your keys. Absolutely. And then a feature that we want to add that has been requested a ton is eventually, I, I don't know exactly when we're going to get to it, but eventually we're going to add a per hero key binding. Yeah. So you can switch your keys around. Like if, if you just want, you know, Tracer's shift to be her E, you could just switch it sure. for Tracer's. So. We also want to add per hero options to that as well. So you can have, because I know a lot of people have trouble playing Widow because they're used to toggle zoom instead of uh, hold zoom. So we'll have that kind of option as well. Hi, I've been playing the game at home, and for all the people who are watching at home, what you announced earlier today about buying the game and getting the heroes, I just wanted to confirm is that if you buy the retail release, do you get all the heroes now and forthcoming, or do you have to buy all the heroes after the 21 that you get? Well, right, right now there are only 21 heroes in Overwatch, and you get them all. Um, and that's all we're focused on right now. Um, we're really focused on the remaining content and features that we want to add for our spring launch. And at this time, we feel like the 21 Heroes is really robust. The game plays really well. It's sort of a future decision for us of whether or not Overwatch supports more heroes, and if so, in what way, shape, or form will those be introduced to the players? We want to see the game not only in beta, but in launch, be healthy and not be overwhelming to people first before we even cross that bridge of what new heroes are, are coming down the line. Yeah, hi. Uh, just a follow-up to that question. Um, I love the design of the characters. Almost every character feels unique. Every situation is different. You can switch between them. What goes into that design? Do you guys look to put in characters that can bring a new element to the genre or the games? So what, what is the initial design behind that? Well, from a design perspective, absolutely. We're trying to create new design space and design opportunities for the gameplay side as well. But I mean, the concept guys are all, some, half the time, they're just drawing awesome stuff. And we're just looking at it like, that's amazing. We've got to put that in somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the ideas really come from anywhere. Sometimes these guys have a cool idea, sometimes we have a cool idea. So whatever is you know, popular and whatever the team is really loving is what we kind of push up to the surface. Plus ninjas. And, <laughs> and more ninjas. Three ninjas? Oh. Could it be done? They said it couldn't be um, done. Sort of a follow-up question to that one. Were there any elements, either aesthetically or gameplay-wise, that you guys played around with but weren't really able to make work? Oh, man. 
Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's kind of the almost the mantra of our studio. I mean, we're all about iteration. We we try so many things. I mean, you guys have already seen. Last year we announced, and you know, Bastion had one ult, and even now he's got a different ult, and that was just one thing that you guys have seen. But what you didn't see is in between those two, he had like five other ults that we tried. Yeah. He, you know, he was throwing grenades up in there one time. He was literally like, flying, flying at around at one point. It was shooting insane. through walls. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was a little crazy, but um, yeah, just all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Genji's katana, too. Oh, you, yeah. uh, the katana on primary was fascinating because we would do a play test and he would just murder everybody with it. Genji's and then, like, this feels great. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> and the, the only the person who played Genji was like, it's the best thing ever, and everybody else would complain. <laughs> so we would retune it, and then I remember having it tuned to these points where it was like, you're hacking on people. <laughs> right. and. It's like a couple seconds later, you're like, I think Genji needs a break and stretch a little bit, and then he's going to hack on people before they die. So that was another one where yeah. we just had to scrap it. Yeah, at one point, I think he even like hung onto the wall and stuff, and then you see these Genjis oh, yeah, just hanging right. out up there, and then they kind of drop on you and start <laughs> slashing at you, shoot him in the face. That was fun. Uh, hello, my name is Belf Druid for the win on Twitter, and I was wondering how modder friendly will this game be? Like, say, if I want to make mo uh, custom skins, custom gameplay, custom maps, would I be allowed to do that, or is it just you play like this? So, um, uh, Blizzard's studio philosophy, I think if you look back in the history of Blizzard, we support modding wholeheartedly. We're very big believers in it. Um, you know, World of Warcraft had its customizable user interface, and we saw some incredible creations come from that. Um, Dota would not exist if it were not for Warcraft 3's moddable um, map system, which we thought was fantastic, and they've added that to um, StarCraft 2 as well. So philosophically, we are absolutely believers in modding, and we would like to figure out how to get more of that happening with Overwatch. Right now, our focus is on our spring launch, and I do not think we'll be able to have a lot of modability to, to the game by the time we launch. But it is a value for us to keep pursuing it. A big question is, how do we make our tools and our code accessible to people and really nice and, and sort of a, a good player-facing um, version of our tools. Um, so it's something that we would like to explore, probably not by launch, but we're going to be supporting this game for a long time, and we absolutely believe in modding. Hey, uh, just before I ask my question, um, I'm not a gamer, I'm a Blizzard gamer, and that's a thousand percent because you supported Max from day one, so just that's important. So, uh, I'm curious as you diversify above 21 heroes, like in WoW, kind of one thing that happened is that like, people started saying, oh, there's sort of like this homogenization of roles and abilities, and like, is a Destro lock that different from a Fire Mage? And like, as you expand that cast, how do you continue to keep each character unique? So. Yeah, um, actually, if, if you don't mind, yeah. like, we, we feel pretty good about the 21 heroes right now. I, I feel like we're at one of our limits where 21 feels fantastic. They feel very unique and very diverse. Um, there's also the read of the game. If you're like a new player coming into it, just do you know what's going on? Do you know what the other guy's doing um, on the other end of the barrel down there? So at this point, we're pretty committed to, to 21, um, and we haven't thought much beyond that, but we have, we have explored you know, what might exist um, with new heroes when, like last year we had 12 and we added nine over the course of the year, so yeah. you can speak to like what adding those extra nine was like. Sure, I mean, like I just answered in the last question, we're trying stuff all the time, and a lot of stuff doesn't work, and so we th we are trying new stuff and throwing stuff out all the time, but a lot of times we'll, we'll have a really cool idea, and it, it doesn't quite work maybe just for that hero, but we really like the idea, so we kind of save it off. So we do have some sort of, like, almost like this palette of really cool ideas out there still that feel very unique. But I mean, I, I feel like personally, I feel like there's a lot of design space to explore still. I don't think we're, uh, we're in any danger um, in that way. But I think, um, yeah, our, our 21 here complement each other very well. Hi, um, I was thinking, I'm like, like Tracer here. Are we going to get like an alternate version of her or uh, 
So, it's like, uh, uh, like a different skin. Because some people like her, or another person likes her. They're kinji, whether male or female, for like a different uh, upgrades and everything. Because some people just like a certain character, or. Uh, mm. Well, the, I'm sorry, it's the kind of had the thought that I lost it. <laughs> Uh, but that's kind of the thing when we're going to be able to see different versions of them, like the existing heels. Like, um, for like a male, uh, in that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so right now, um, as we announce the Origins edition of the game, it's the first skins that we've announced. So we are excited to see um, different versions of the characters. We haven't thought about changing the genders of the characters necessarily. Like, if you look at the Tracer skin, for example, that, that we did, um, it's Slipstream Tracer, which is a story about how she originally went through that accident that turned her into this time-warping adventurer. So, out the gate, I think we, um, we want as many of our skins as possible to sort of support the yeah. lore and the backstory. So we haven't gotten into switching alternate uh, versions or genders of the characters at this point. Yeah, I think we'll leave the uh, gender bending to the cosplayers. <laughs> There's a male Zarya walking around somewhere. I don't know if you guys saw that. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, it yeah that was awesome. awesome. <laughs> Uh, so, I was wondering, when will the new character be released for the beta? Well, um, I think that all has to do with how much time the development team spends at the Hilton Bar later tonight. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, most likely um, sometime next week, probably. Hi. Uh, not, oh, is that good? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, now that the game is being released for PS4 and Xbox One, have you looked into doing a split screen co op for when they're released? S split screen co op would be awesome. Yeah. Um, we don't have plans to support it at, th at this time, but um, it's a killer idea. You spoke earlier about rebinding keys and other customization options that you were going to add, uh, like character-specific things. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about changes to the UI and how the game looks. Will you be able to turn off the UI entirely, scale down things like WoW, change your FOV? I think you can do that one. Actually, um, a lot of the things you mentioned you can already do. You can turn off the UI entirely. You hit Alt-Z, just like World of Warcraft, and that works. Um, we added the FOV slider based on your feedback. <laughs> we we heard you loud and clear. Um, and then UI is an interesting one. Um, we don't plan to have a fully customizable UI like World of Warcraft, but we would like, we have an amazing UI designer by the name of Jeremy Craig. And um, his belief is that we, we could add more UI options rather than having a completely customizable UI, add certain options to certain features. So. An example that he gives is that there's a lot of desire for changing the reticle. Um, some people just want to change the shape or the color. It's something we believe in. I don't know when we're going to get to it. Um, it's not something we want to drop everything we're doing right now and make a whole reticle system, but we're not opposed to it either. So um, it's something we believe in, but probably on a per feature basis in the UI. Um, but we'll, we'll keep reading the, the feedback and suggestions and see what we end up with. Thank you. This will be our last question. Uh, so you've talked about balancing characters, which shows some level of uh, esports. Um, and my question really is, are you going to be working on making a league for console and or the PC versions? Well, we, we're going to support, um, we're going to support esport and console um, Together, we haven't announced what the big plans for Overwatch are in terms of eSport, but we really look at our three platforms as equal and we believe in all of them. We know that there are players of uh, amazing skill levels across all three platforms, and when it comes to eSport, we want to make sure that there is um, support given not only to PC but to console as well. Um, no official plans at this point. That's coming at a future date. We have a lot um, in store for eSport in the future. All right. Well, that's it for us, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Please everybody. come tomorrow at 11.30 yes. a.m.
We'll see you guys Thanks, later. Guys. Have fun. Go play the game.